All right. I love this movie so much. Oh my god. Like we were talking about before, like every kid from our era who grew up watching this has like a soft spot. Yeah, my friend used to go home and watch it like every day. I've watched it a plethora of times. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the Sports Experience Podcast. I'm Dom DiTola over here with my co-host Chris Quinn. And today we are finishing off our little weekend action of some Denver Broncos history. Yeah, I feel like we were in Denver Broncos in the late 70s. And you know what? We're going to get it into the late 80s now. Let's get it into the 80s. Let's get it into the cocaine and beginning Zubaz time. I was just, Zubaz for me marks the end of the 80s more than anything else. I feel like it'll come back one day. Mm, may, no, no, I can't, no, I can't back it. <laughs> I'm, I'm bringing it back. There you go. It's Not, like non-workout, just like super nerdy kids. Wearing yeah, it. I, I will just wear it to work. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're getting into this episode. The three amigos, three wide receivers, the pretty much the targets for John Elway in this in this era. For the middle of Elway's career, these were the three main guys that he threw to and enjoyed a tremendous amount of success with. Basically, the best wide receivers he had until probably Rod Smith and Easy Ed McCaffrey. Yeah, yeah. In the mid to late 90s. But uh, three guys, three amigos, and we'll get into how they are nicknamed the three amigos. Obviously, there's three of them. Yeah. The Lone Rangers. That's the dumbest name ever. How what can you, you pluralize the Lone Rangers? <laughs> well, there's three of you. You're not exactly lone. Their reaction to that. Oh, God. They're dude. almost just like figuring it out like, Oh, yeah. No, that's great. Adam Sandler, I don't get it. I don't get it. And then his explanation of his tattoos. If anybody doesn't know, we're talking about uh, Airheads, Airheads. which is completely not Three Amigos based, but uh, still a funny movie. But there's still a great movie about a trio. Yeah, there's there's three wide receivers for John Elway, uh, Mark Jackson, Vance Johnson and Ricky Nateel. And the interesting thing about all three of these guys, they kind of remind me of when the Steelers had Antonio Brown, Emmanuel Sanders, and Mike Wallace on the same team for a few years for Roethlisberger. Yeah. Similar kind of quarterback to Elway. And the reason I say this is they're all shorter guys. Jackson, 5'9", 180, Nateel, 5'9", 180, and Vance Johnson, 5'11", 185. I was going to say, they're one of the shortest uh, wide receiver cores that I saw because nowadays you wouldn't see these guys. You'll have a shorter guy or two, but you'll have your you know, red zone, big dominant down the field guys. But the reason I compare them to those guys um, that the Steelers had about a decade ago, all playing together is they're all speedy. They're all quick, good hands. And despite their size, they all work three levels of the field. Oh yeah. So it's, it's an intriguing thing. The NFL really hadn't seen before, particularly with three wide receivers of this caliber, but Denver, Kind of bereft at wide receiver after kind of um, Rick Upchurch and Haven Moses leave. Uh, Steve Watson had a good uh, Pro Bowl year, I believe, in 81, but he's nearing kind of the end of his career when these guys start coming to the team. 85. 85 is the first one, and that is Vance Johnson. And he comes out of... University of Arizona. There you go. Star at Choya High School on the track team and on the football team. He's in the Pimas County Sports Hall of Fame, actually. Sure is. And I just want to say this about him real quick. He was actually a running back. Um, His first couple years at U of A, he was a running back. He was a very versatile athlete, guy you put in motion, guy you could put in the backfield, and... I believe these were teams coached by Larry Smith. So, I mean, they weren't slouches. I mean, they were pretty competitive in the Pac-12 or 10, I guess, at the time. Yeah, or 8 even. Who knows back then? But he had almost Pac-4. Two, he had almost uh, 2,000 rushing yards in college, yep. 10 touchdowns led the Pac-10 in 1983. 104 catches, 11 touchdowns. I mean, he's a versatile athlete. Well, talking about him being a versatile athlete, he was a long jump champion in well, 82. Long jump champion, and he uh, made the Olympic team yeah. as well. He... Uh, Very versatile, but the way the draft worked, and I think this is why he fell to pick 31 for Denver, because Denver had traded up to get him, is because he played different positions, you maybe not have had a fit for him. And NFL, maybe stodgy thinking at the time, is like, well, if we don't know where to play him, why are we going to take him? Yes. But the Broncos... But he's such a great athlete. But the Broncos are just like, we'll find a way to get him the ball. Yeah. We'll find a way to get him the ball. Exactly. as uh, as a rookie, he does... uh, does a heck of a job for them. I mean, he has uh, 31 uh, 
51 catches for 721 yards and three uh, uh, touchdowns. So, I mean, that's a rookie. That's you're, he, he established himself as a number two guy behind Steve Watson. Right away. Right away. Yeah. Unfortunately for uh, the Broncos, in 85, that was one of those wonky years where even winning 10 games doesn't get you into the playoffs. Yeah, I saw that, which, I mean, those are... I, I understand that they're trying to correct that now with all the wild card spot with all the wild card spots, but that this yeah is, I think they won ten or eleven that year yeah. yeah which is sad to think that you win ten or eleven and you don't get into the playoffs I mean that's such a great year to not you know continue on but oh totally but they had come off of a really good eighty four season where um uh, they had upset in the divisional round against Pittsburgh but it almost set up an Elway Marino AFC title game yep. so Denver's they're cooking because Elway's in heading into year four and eighty six. And uh, draft comes around again, but they will wait a little bit longer though for their new wide receiver. Yeah, so they go, the they pick up Mark Johnson, Jackson, excuse me. Yeah, um, not the basketball player. Not the basketball player. I I thought it was interesting. He was only five nine. Yeah, Mark Johnson. I I thought Jackson. God damn, I just keep messing that up. You good, but right? um, he was only five nine, which is so small for a receiver. But he was so fast, and this is something I looked up on every single one of these guys. Was they're like, yeah, but they were outrunning everybody. Yeah, they, and because of the new offensive rules, uh, yep. you can only check a guy within five yards. So if he gets past you or on top of you. He's gone. Well, I feel like in in these defenses, they were like, all right, we're going to put our fast guy on your fast guy. And uh -huh. Denver was like, hey, we have all fast guys. So exactly. It, they just couldn't check them like you normally would. And if one's not going to eat or two aren't going to eat, the other one will. And Jackson falls to the sixth round. And part of the reason is in his college career, he only started one season for Purdue. Yeah. Just 40, but his senior year, he's got 43 catches, 732 yards, and five touchdowns in 85. So I, I want to point this out and but kind of where, where you're at with it was should he have dropped that far? Because it's so hard to pick up a guy who only has one season well, of and college. See, I think that's what happens is because he's not going to wow you with his size. No. He only has one real season of productivity. So, of course, he's going to fall. Yeah. Because the draft is always a crapshoot. But Denver's like, we'll gladly take him off your hands for you. And they do. And it leads to some terrific success because 1986, they go 11 and 5 and win the division. Yep. Johnson has a little bit more of a down year 31 catches, 363 yards, and two TDs. But Jackson, he's the one that really does well. He led the team in receiving yards, 738, and had. 35 catches. Well, something that I saw that he pretty much said was he felt like he should have been drafted a lot higher. And as soon as he got drafted, he was like, I'm coming into this team and I'm making an impact. That was something that he said he wanted to do right away because he kind of felt like almost disrespect, almost, you know, didn't get the respect that he yeah, felt he didn't like get he deserved. The respect, but luckily for the Broncos, exactly. all you really have is a Steve Watson and a Vance Johnson. And, they roll into the playoffs and play the defending AFC title uh, uh, champions, uh, New England Patriots. And in that game, which they did win 22-17, to 17, it's Vance Johnson who has a 48-yard touchdown in the yeah. third quarter to really kind of break everything open. And uh, while Jackson doesn't necessarily do as well, what ends up happening is it sets up one of the most important games in Broncos and NFL history – at Cleveland Municipal Stadium the following week for the AFC Championship. So this is in 87? 86. Well, it's January of 87. You're right. It's the, it's the a, season. Yeah, the AFC Championship game. So uh, against the Browns. Against the Browns. One of the greatest franchises in NFL history. At losing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. God, it, that was perfect. Oh, that, well, that was set up very nicely. But uh, in the game... It's shitty conditions. Passing isn't really necessarily a factor. Um, Johnson only has three catches for 25 yards. And Jackson only has two catches. But one of them. They are, no, oh. two of them. Oh, okay. Both of them are very, very important. And I'll bring this up because if you don't know, Cleveland takes, with about five minutes to go, a 20 to 13 lead. Yep. On Mark Mosley's botch kickoff, Ken Bell, who's one of the returners, him and Gene Lang are back there ready to receive it. The ball bounces all weird and kind of gets behind him, and Bell has to cover it up at the one-and-a-half-yard line, basically. And Mark Jackson, who was Bell's roommate as well as teammate, always jokes, 
hey, man, if you'd taken that ball to the 50-yard line, nobody would be talking about the drive. Yeah, but that's literally what this is called is the drive. And when you say the drive to any football fans, they know what they they know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Elway comes into it like Jackson has a great story. Their center, Keith Bishop, came running into the huddle and he was like, we got him right where we want him, boys. No, that's so awesome because literally you're on your own one and you have to go the entire field. And even though there are only two amigos, Elway does a great job on this drive of really spreading the ball around, like to get out of his own end zone, just a solid screen pass to Sammy Winder to get like maybe five to seven yards has an incredible bullet in the seam to Steve Sewell, who was like a running back receiver for them on those eighties, nineties teams. Um, to really move the ball. He's just moving the ball with his legs, has a couple good scrambles, but he does take a sack by, I believe, Dave Pizzuli around midfield, Brown's defensive lineman. And yeah. what happens is they're set up with a third and 18. Mind you, Jackson has zero catches at this point in the game. Comes into the huddle with the play, and Jackson's like, oh my God, it's coming to me. Mm-hmm. Elway fires a bullet. He gets great protection. And on this play, if you ever watch it, Bishop on the snap, because they're going with a silent count, because the dog pound is just raucous at this point. You can't hear shit. Steve Watson is coming across the formation in motion. And because the silent count got messed up, Bishop's snap hit Steve Watson in the hip on the play. On any other circumstance, the ball could have just deadened and hit the hit the ground. But Elway leans forward and is able to basically just get it, save it just in time, drops back, and fires an absolute bullet to Jackson for 20 yards to keep the sticks moving. Yep. Elway has another good scramble to get him down to about the five-yard line. And this is what sets up one of the biggest plays in Denver Broncos history and NFL history. Elway drops back. From his, from his five-yard line, he's back there, and he fires. It's even harder than that 20-yard pass he threw. Jackson always talks about how big his eyes were. Yeah, I was I looking at him. And mind you, if he doesn't have the strongest arm in league history, Elway has to be like top three. So how these guys are catching the ball and not having their fingers and hands destroyed, but to catch that pass on that like little slant pattern for Jackson to set up the game-tying extra point, Freaking amazing. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Those were his only two catches, but they're arguably the two most important catches of the entire season for them. Yeah, and that's something that I saw was in this, the the thing, the quote that everyone says is in the drive is like everyone gives it up to Elway, but these are the two catches that were like it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, not to, not to diminish Winder getting him out of the end zone or Sewell's yeah, yeah. big gainer. I think even Watson had a good catch on that drive. But, like, those were the two ones that – those were the money plays. Those are the ones you needed. Yep. And Denver eventually, in overtime, went on a Rich Carlos field goal to go to the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, this is the era of Denver Broncos Super Bowls that the Simpsons like to make fun of. Yes. <laughs> it's 56-7 to seven in L.A. with a patented touchdown drive at the end. Well, and I want to bring this up because – we see them be historic losers here, and I feel like it's not given as much it attention. Well, it is, but I feel like because the Bills proceed to go four yeah. consecutive losses, and as opposed to the Broncos going three of four, you so, know what I mean? So, like, it's almost it's almost foreshadowed by that because this is, if not one of the teams that should have had should have at least one Super Bowl multiple. So I've. Uh, I I got a good uh, thing about this one. Gary Kubiak, who later became offensive coordinator, winning Super Bowls in Denver, head coach, won their last Super Bowl for them. He was always backup at the time. Okay. And when he was an offensive coordinator for him, when they went to the Super Bowl against the Packers, they were interviewing him about, you know, Elway losing all these Super Bowls. And Kubiak basically said straight up to this reporter, like, we're not even in those games without John Elway. Oh, yeah. The team, it's the Amigos were good. But the defense had some star players, but they were not even close to the caliber of those Bills teams that went to four in a row. This was just 
Elway taking a team there. Yeah, just putting a team on his shoulder. And as you'll see in this Super Bowl after 86 when they play the Giants, they're actually winning at halftime 10-9. to Yeah. And they had totally fucked up a goal line situation where they should have even gotten three points out of it. They could have gone up, um, I believe, 17-7. to And Rich Carlos misses a chip shot, like 20 yards, something, something odd field goal. Yeah. And in the second half, the wheels come off. And the Giants just, you know, beat the hell out of them yeah, as far that, as just winning it all. Well, that's what you were saying with this, the Simpsons making fun of them because they really get blown out of all of these Super Bowls and they're not, they're almost not at the caliber of a Super Bowl team, but Elway keeps taking them there. Yeah, and Johnson, although he put up some good garbage time stats and even had a um, touchdown at the very end, you know, he had over 100 yards receiving. Yep. They still lose by 19 points, and the game's not even that close. No, I it's mean, not. The That's, second half yeah. was just a Parcells avalanche. Be- Parcells and Belichick avalanche, I should say. Yeah. But uh, 87, some interesting stuff happens to Denver in that – they acquire their final amigo. And I find it interesting is that, you know, you do have Johnson and Jackson, but at this time there is an internal kind of struggle going on in Denver and the amigos are kind of part of this and why they kind of acquire their last player. I believe Elway wants to air the ball out more because Dan Marino is putting up video game numbers guy in the same draft class as him offenses around the league in general are opening up more and Elway has a great relationship with offensive coordinator then at the time, Mike Shanahan. And Mike Shanahan sees this and is basically under the impression, yeah, we need to use this Hall of Fame generational player more throwing the football. Yeah, he's our star player. Let's play through him. And Dan Reeves of the old Landry school, of the run the ball, you know, the ground game wins every game is like... Control the clock and yeah. Yeah, control the clock, you know, don't make mistakes even though you're a freaking amazing player so essentially don't air the ball out yeah it's this like not even a love triangle it's just this you know elway and shanahan basically against reeves yeah and there's even there was talk that reeves told shanahan okay if you want to call the plays you have to come in on your day off with elway to call plays in the game and they both did because they wanted to do it so bad they were like Okay. Okay, fine. We don't need a day off. If we get to have the latitude to do it, let's do it. And in the 87 draft, obviously, because they had just finished as runners up, they're picking towards the end of the first round. Yep. And what they're able to do is draft Ricky the Rocket Nateel out of University of Florida. And I feel like these guys, so I want to bring it all together as the three amigos. These guys are so different Mm -hmm. individually. So Vance... Um, we'll probably bring up his post career had some problems with alcohol and stuff. Um, and then I saw that Mark Jackson kind of did just, he does sports talk and he's an investment guy. I was just going to say he was just like middle of the road. And then Ricky was more of like a religious, but very much, uh, school oriented. So I saw that he went to Florida on an academic scholarship. He was a quarterback in In high school. He was a hell of an all around athlete. That's yeah. And now he's suing the NFL for concussions. I know he's in this little group and we're going to do one. I swear to God on, on, uh, three parters and yeah, a three parter and probably on soccer. You know what? I'm not going to tangent the shit out of this right now, but so they pick him up. Uh, what was it like 29? It was right at 27, 20. It was right at the end of the first round, but he had two, really i mean he played all four years of florida yes i mean he was a great punt returner too he's in, for him he's in the gator hall of fame yeah i mean he's one of the best wide receivers that wide receiver factory has ever produced yes the wide receiver factory i love that hey everybody just want to take a quick break to uh, let you know that our sports experience podcast is brought to you by engel studio here and uh they're here in tucson for all your recording needs uh last two years combined 75 catches uh 1,332 yards, uh, 13 yards, uh, 13 touchdowns uh, uh, receiving, and uh, one rushing touchdown. Yeah. So, I mean, he's he's a first-round pick. He has the pedigree. Johnson was drafted, I think, 31 overall, which would have made him a first-round pick. But, like, everybody's talking, like, this is, this is the guy. This is the last piece and to this puzzle. As the offenses are opening up more and you're running three wide receiver sets, this is, like, pleasing to Elway and Shanahan to be like, 
Oh, we have another one. We have another speed guy who can work all three levels of the field. He might be small, but man, he's going to do some good things for us. Yep. And uh, what's weird about 87, though, is as we brought up in our free agency episodes, that was the strike year. So not the Amigos are finally all together, but the strike happens and only 15 regular season games are played. Yep. And sometimes the starters miss more than that. But I want to get into, before this season starts, this is where the nickname comes to be. And Vance Johnson will tell the story of how he was in training camp and he's watching Three Amigos, the movie Three Amigos. The movie, yes. And if you've never seen Three Amigos, it's basically the original Tropic Thunder, as Tony Brune likes to say. Steve Martin, Martin Short, Chevy Chase, My Little Buttercup should be played every time. But anyway... (laughs) <laughs> he's watching three amigos and vance johnson goes like hey man what do you see and mark jackson's like what do you mean he's like that's three white guys being amigos <laughs> he's like why can't three brothers be amigos yep. so he gets together with jackson and Atiel, and he's like three of us were the three amigos so in a press conference later in the preseason they ask him like vance johnson all these questions hey how does the team look how does the receiving core look and vance johnson goes well I think John's going to be happy with the three amigos this year. Yep. And that John Elway knew none of this, no. by the way. And then they ask him later, like, oh, did you nickname those guys the three amigos? And he's like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Why not? So it, it just stuck, but it became like a phenomenon that year because not only did it was Elway the league MVP in 87, Denver was really good. Yeah. I mean, they, they had a stacked roster returning and with, you know, the extra stuff from Natio bringing the offense. Mind you, in a shortened season, combined 99 catches, 1,750 yards, and 11 touchdowns from three dudes. Well, it's just good marketing. And And it's perfect marketing because the better that these guys are playing, oh, my God. It just keeps feeding into it. It's like the Orange Crush. The the Denver you know, media and Denver fans just ate it all up. And uh, probably their biggest game that year, I did want to mention – they play a Monday nighter against the Bears at home at Mile High. Mind you, the Bears had um, a team. They were two years removed from Super Bowl shuffling, but they had a a good team. They won the division and had a, a first round bye that year. Okay. The problem was the Amigos, because the Bears were playing that 46-esque type defense, when you have speed at receiver and a mobile quarterback with an incredible release and you are blitzing all the time, you are going to get the shit kicked out of you. Yeah, you're, there's... That's why Marino dominated him in that game in 85, and this is why Elway and the Amigos did it too. The first three touchdowns of the game to go up 21 to nothing, Elway threw one to Jackson, Johnson, and Natil. Yeah. It's, it's a great game on uh, YouTube. It's somewhere out there in the ether. It's just absolutely fantastic. And they won 31 to 29, but that was kind of like their big coming out party, like to the national audience. Showing everybody that this receiving core can beat a great defense with just speed. Because like we were saying, like, I don't know if you would see these receivers, especially as one receiving core because of their size, because they're so short and because they're so reliant on speed, but they pretty much show like, hey, we can still do this. But they work all three levels of the field so yeah. well because they're adept route runners and they're smart. To me, it's an ever, to me, receiver isn't always about size. Obviously, you want size at yeah. that position, but it's always like, how open can you get? How much separation can you create? And yeah. Can you catch the ball? I mean, if you're 6'4", 215 pounds, I know it's... and can do that, I'll prefer you over a I shorter know, that's, guy. Yeah. But if these guys can do it, man, feed them. Yeah. Let them eat. Uh, and something I want to say is it's not always just straight speed. It's that acceleration of, you know, cutting one way and going the other. Yeah, I feel like these guys can get out of the brakes. Yeah. And these guys all could get out of the brakes. Exactly. Fast. Exactly. But uh, divisional win. Yeah. They play the Oilers. Vance had over 105 yards receiving. The problem was he suffered a groin injury. Oh, yeah. And because of this, they later found out he was internally bleeding. So Damn. Johnson was unable to participate, even though, you know, Denver has that first round by their AFC West champions. They have to go in to the AFC championship against Cleveland, this time at home. Yeah. And I will admit the reason they're playing this game at home is because the NFL had to cancel one game in the 1987 regular season, as far as every team only played a 15 game schedule. Mm-hmm. 
the game that got canceled for the Broncos was a game against the Browns. If they had played that game and Cleveland would have won, Denver would have had to go back to the mistake by the lake and play that game. But by virtue of them not playing it, they had the advantage of a better record and Cleveland coming to mile high in 87. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And despite the fact that despite the fact that they're missing Vance Johnson, this was a game where both Natiel and Jackson went absolutely nuts in. Yes. Well, I want to say this, though, because it, it felt like with Vance Johnson going out, they could really mark up Natiel and Jackson and pretty much shut them down. Yeah. Which is what I would think, but they just show that it was just like, no, we're that much better of receivers and Elway's that much better of a quarterback. And he had Cleveland's number. And he had him dead to rights at the beginning. And while everybody blames Ernest Biner for this game, A, he's the (laughs) only reason Cleveland is in the game on their furious comeback. But B... Mark Jackson and Ricky Natiel are all over the field that day. Yeah, Natiel opens the game with a touchdown after an early turnover. Elway makes this great pass. You have, you have to watch it. He looks Natiel's way first to kind of draw the defense over. Looks away, completely freezes the inside linebacker. I believe it's Mike Johnson. And then you just see this 84. Natiel was 84. Jackson was 80. Johnson was 82. You just see this flash towards the back of the end zone and this bullet just right there to yeah. him. What was it? I think Merlin Olsen or Dick Enberg on the game was like, he threw that so hard he almost knocked him out of the end zone. <laughs> but the the other big play, Natiel had a great game, five catches, 95 yards, and a touchdown. The backbreaker, and to me this was a backbreaker even over Biner's fumble, is Cleveland makes the score 21-10 to 10 at the beginning of the third quarter. Denver gets the ball back deep in their own territory, and Elway, the pocket breaks down. He's scrambling around, and he finds Jackson on an outlet pass. Basically, Jackson coming back, you know, break off his route, coming back to the football, and Elway fires one to him. Jackson makes the first guy miss. Then he makes the second guy miss, and the third guy miss. I forget who had a great block. I might have been Sewell down the sideline to completely spring him. Jackson races 80 yards for the touchdown yeah. to go up 18 in the middle of the third quarter. Like, if you're looking at plays in that game... To lock down that game, yeah. I'm, I'm not even looking at Ernest Biner. I'm looking at that one. That was where Cleveland should have said, enough is enough. We're making this at least 21-13 to 13 after we stop you. But Jackson, leading receiver in that game, four catches, 134 for a touchdown. And the Amigos, after a 38-33 win, are going to the Super Bowl. They... That's when it just all exploded. Well, them. first uh, first Super Bowl since 77 for them. Yeah. No, no, no. They made it the year before. Oh, they made the year. Yeah, sorry. You're oh, right. You're good, man. Yeah. <laughs> but 10 years since 77. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to say this, though, about this receiving core is in something that I see that teams really want now is they make plays after they catch the ball. It's not a catch and essentially like turn into a tackle. Well, it's, that's what makes these guys made these guys interesting to watch is that on any given play, the rack yards are all going to be there. Yes. If Elway puts it in the right spot, which he does, and this guy, <laughs> which he almost always did, these guys are in the right spot and they're angled up the field or to the side and running away. Like yep. if he hits them in stride, They're Johnson, done. former running back, yep. Jackson, fast as shit. Natiel, good God, down the field. Like they're dangerous because not only are they catching it, you have to tackle them. Yes. And no, yeah, that's why I thought it was so great. And I feel like before they even knew that they were going to be this great, coming up with the three amigos and being like, dude, it's going to be us. Yeah. Was so awesome and right? so just like, yeah. No, hey I love who, shit like that. Hey, guy who hasn't taken an NFL snap exactly, yet. Exactly. That's what join I mean. our group. <laughs> but uh, so they roll into the Super Bowl. Yep. Johnson barely available because he's still suffering from that uh, groin injury. But, and this is a game my dad actually attended, Super Bowl 22. Oh, that's awesome. Redskins. I was going to ask. Yeah, I was going to ask about Because it was this. in whoa, San whoa, Diego. The Washington R oh, word. Yeah, the Washington R word. Yeah, the Washington Redskins in this game. I'm going to use it. I don't give a shit. Doesn't matter. Um, that this, this is one of these Super Bowls that we see. They just couldn't get there. So what, my dad <laughs> describes it like this. It's a beautiful day. It's San Diego. Everything is great. Game starts. You got the MVP at quarterback. First play from scrimmage. Elway, 56 yards to Natiel up the sideline on a bomb for a touchdown. 
Then they get a field goal on the next. They're up 10 to zero heading into the second quarter. And then the fucking wheels fall off. <laughs> I was going to say the, the first quarter you look at this, you're like, here we go. This, this is, is Denver. It. This, this is the amigos. They're going to be in every commercial ever till for the rest of the eighties. Well, you just, you, you picture them not going a quarter without scoring. Let me just yeah. say that because their offense is so good. So when you go up 10, nothing first quarter, you're like, Oh shit, here we go. We're going to win 28, you know, and whatever that, that Natil bomb Elway just from almost yep. the opposite side of the field, just throws this strike. I mean, this is just like a rocket and Ricky, the rocket catches it and score like it takes off. Washington looked completely out of sorts after the first 15 minutes of the game. Yes. And then the second quarter happens. And if it's you like two different teams come out, it, I'm not even kidding. If you don't know what happened in that second quarter, Washington scored 35 straight points. It's insane. Doug Williams threw four touchdowns. Like, legitly, it's the most dominant 15 minutes of football that has probably ever occurred, not only in Super Bowl history, but NFL history. Well, and it's so ridiculously dominant because it just comes off of them essentially getting spanked like 10 nothing is pretty big the next quarter they go they do 35 nothing on scoring you know what i mean and this was the game that a year later got joe collier fired yes <laughs> their defensive coordinator yes because the second quarter like i'm saying it's like two different teams came out what ended up happening doug williams set a then super bowl record with four touchdown passes tied it um for that the problem was denver's defensive line completely fell apart timmy smith like a sixth round pick who later got busted by the Denver police for cocaine. Yep. Probably should have been the Super Bowl MVP. He had 200 yards rushing. And like when you watch Denver's defense in that game, Washington's offensive line, of course, the hogs, they're open. The holes they're opening for this guy. Like they're like two people in a wide. rascal could gain six yards. Yes, exactly. It's, it's really insane and, and it's it's sad because not only are they controlling the ball elway's not getting the ball to the amigos yes they don't score after the first quarter i know it all just evaporates they lose 42 to 10 and this is why and we're gonna bring it up as many goddamn times as we can but this is why the simpsons were so accurate oh, with God. their making fun of the broncos because they literally shit the bed every single time they got oh there. the denver broncos <laughs> i think owning the denver broncos is pretty good you just don't understand football marge <laughs> well why not you just, just don't, don't understand, understand. football <laughs> oh god god bless you hank scorpio oh, that I is know. oh man i he is the ultimate boss but uh 88 they come back the problem is is after 87 because they've built this amazing offense mike shanahan goes to the raiders to yep. be their head coach we could do an episode on that tenure and his hatred of Al Davis, but um, 88, they're without Shanahan, but they're still a good team. The problem is they finish 8-8. Eight and eight. I was going to say, this is where you see still a good team, still a good offense, but they are not clicking. But And this is probably the... And this is sad because this is the window where all three can play together. Yes. And they're all very productive. Johnson, 65 catches, 896 yards, five touchdowns. Jackson, 46 catches, 552 yards, six touchdowns. Natiel, 46 catches, 574 yards and a touchdown. I mean, like, they're good. They're good. They're just... And, and they that year they beat the eventual Super Bowl champion San Francisco on a game-tying touchdown catch by Vance Johnson. I mean, it's still a good team. It's just the wheels came off on the defense. Yeah, it, it was. it's really interesting where you see this. And Elway missed a game. They lost up at Three Rivers Stadium that yeah. Kubiak had to play. It was just a wonky season, but all three guys are so productive. Yeah, well, you see this great these great teams and just like one or two pieces kind of fall apart and really they can't get it going. Like their offense is still humming. They just can't stop teams essentially. And that's why they go eight and eight in the season is like, it's just it's, not the same team. It's almost a wasted season. Cause what could it have is. been? Because that year in the AFC Cincinnati goes to the freaking Super Bowl. Like, come on. You're that's better brutal. than that. Is that their only Super Bowl appearance? No, they played uh, San Francisco in 81. Okay. Too, okay. Before, but. Uh, oh, before that. Yes. Okay. 89. Uh, 89 was tough. Um, well, uh, Johnson probably had a close to a Pro Bowl year. He had over 1,000 yards receiving. Yes. And seven touchdowns. And Jackson was his normal steady self. Uh, 
25 for 446 and two touchdowns. The problem is Natil gets hurt. He has a patellar injury, and it, it's the type of injury that ended up sapping his speed and I was kind of ruining it. I was just going to say, this is the type of injury that ruins what makes these guys special. And I, I've seen it in soccer injuries where you're like, wow, that guy's great. Injury, he comes back, you're like, who the hell is that guy? Yeah, it's like Terrell Davis when he after he got Yes, you know. no, it, it's really sad because there is no coming back from these serious it, – it, it's really sad because – he was really banking on his speed and he just doesn't have it anymore. He doesn't have it. And he misses eight games that year. Um, but Denver's still pretty damn good. I mean, they wouldn't, uh, they win the division 11 and five. And in the AFC of that time in the long, long ago, 11 and five got you a number one seed in the playoffs, which yeah. is disturbing uh, <laughs> to think about, but, uh, they play a divisional game, which, uh, Really breaks my heart. Uh, breaks my mom's heart too. The, they get the upstart Steelers to oh. come off an upset at the Astrodome the week before, and yeah, they fall behind them, seventeen to seven. The Steelers. That's the that's what I always call the Merrill Hodge game. He had almost like two hundred yards of total offense in that game. It was absolutely insane. Dennis Smith had a great quote. He's like, "Man, we got to get that hoe guy or Hodge, whatever. We got to bust his ass." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Denver comes back. Johnson has a Touchdown reception to tie the game at 17. Um, Jackson had uh, five catches for uh, 111 yards, I believe, and uh, they end up beating him 24 to 23. Yeah, and which they, is a they tight squeak, game. They squeak by. Pittsburgh shit the bed in the fourth quarter. Brister had a fumble, and uh, Mark Stock dropped a pass in the end zone. Like they're considered, even alongside teams that finish sub 500 as like the worst team to ever make the postseason. Yeah. And Denver almost lost to them. I was going to say, yeah, so not not the best coming out. Yeah, but uh, luckily the following week they play Cleveland. Again. Again, part three yep. of AFC championships. And much like the first two, doesn't end well for the Browns. They lose by 16 points. Uh, 37 to 21. I find that really interesting that these two just keep meeting, but it's not really a huge rivalry between them. And I feel like it's because the Browns just never really, to be a rivalry, you really have to have that back and forth. Yeah, and we see them just kind of consecutively losing. I, I can imagine there are a lot of John Elway voodoo dolls in Cleveland. Yes, like, that's true. But I mean, <laughs> it's not the other way. You know what I mean? There's nothing yeah. in Denver where they're like, all right, we got to get these Cleveland. I don't even know who was on the Browns on that time, but you know what Bernie I mean? Bernie Kozar. Bernie because okay. they're most famous. They had Webster Slaughter and Kevin Mack and Biner and those guys. Oh, yeah. All right. And uh, good defense. Uh, what was it? Bob Golick and then uh, Minifield and Dixon at the corners. They were re they were a really good team. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, but uh, enough Browns garbage. But uh, the Broncos play in their third Super Bowl in four years. This is the second one for the Amigos. And this is the – yeah, because they the all the Amigos weren't in the first one. And this is Super Bowl twenty four. Yeah, against okay. the uh, 49ers. Against and the 49ers. this 89-49ers team, I will just say this, at least top five of all time in terms of being the best, they had something like an 18-game, this season was part of it, an 18-game road winning streak. That's insane. This was Montana's finest hour. Yeah. And, like, you know that scene in Deliverance where Rudy's dad has some bad things happen to him? We're like Rudy's dad. The second, the second this game kicks off, the banjo starts. Let's just say that. Um, yeah, no, there were they were in need of lube. Um, this is just, <laughs> yes, they were. This is just one of those things where, like you were saying, I feel like even if the Steelers made it, like if the Steelers end up beating like the Browns, like these are just not great teams coming out of the AFC. <laughs> Look, if Cleveland or Pittsburgh played in that game, they probably would have lost worse. Yeah. San, or San Francisco probably could have hit the 80-point mark Which if is they the, wanted to. Yeah. And, I mean, in this game, the fact that Denver only lost 55-10, to 10, <laughs> like the fact they only lost by that much. Pat yourselves on the back, Like, guys. you showed up. <laughs> that's all you can – that's all – That's all Jesus asks of you, Stan. That's it. But uh, – Nateel, one catch for 28 yards. Johnson, two for 21. Jackson didn't even record a reception. Yeah, they really didn't do shit. Which is hilarious to think. It's like, bro, you were down by like 30 at halftime. You just didn't consider throwing the football. But I mean, when you watch the game, it's it's obvious how much better 
one team is over the other. Yes, I mean, yes. Like, that's and, that. I feel like that was the big thing with this Super Bowl above the other ones is San Francisco was just that much better. Like they're like the Broncos. If they played ten times, they would have lost ten games. It was. Yeah. It's one of those. Um, it, that that was kind of the end run. They have a little whimper there in '91 where they should yep. have probably beat the Bills to go to one of those four in a row, but this this is spent. Yes, and this is about it. This it, is where the amigos end up kind of breaking apart. Yes. Um, something I want to say about them oh, though yeah. is two out of the three of the amigos played their whole careers with the Broncos. I yeah. thought that was awesome. Um, we oh, see yeah. we seen uh, Ricky he has this injury so he's not necessarily going to go off to these other places well, he was but, traded to tampa but then they cut him and he went they back cut to the broncos yes. yeah um but we see vance johnson played his whole career with you know with the broncos and then jackson i think went to the colts well he went to the giants and the Col- the reason okay. he, he had a successful season with the giants and the reason he went there in 93 is very important okay so this is what i wanted to bring up is the breaking up of this yeah so uh jackson goes in 93 because dan reeves is fired after 92 I want to get into 91 and 92 just okay. real quick. Yeah, please. Is that in 90, uh, 1990, they go 5 and 11. The teal only has 18 catches. Uh, Jackson leads the team in receiving yards and touchdowns. Oh, okay. Wide receivers. So that's, that's his year. He has almost 1,000 uh, yards receiving. Damn. But in 91, with Shanahan back, because um, he comes back as offensive coordinator and also because his tenure in Los Angeles was uh, quite crappy. Yeah. Matilda, you only see with 16 catches. Johnson and uh, – Jackson's still productive. He has 33 uh, catches for 603 yards. Um, Johnson's only limited because he's limited by injuries to 21 catches. Um, they're getting replaced, all of them, in the lineup. Okay. Jackson's the only one that can seem to stay on the field. And I wanted to bring up, because there's the last good Amigo moment in the 91 Divisional game, because they finished 12-4. and four. They get this AFC's two seed. Um, they're being replaced by guys like Michael Young. Um, they're getting uh, replaced at other positions by a young wide receiver turned tight end and Shannon Sharp. They're drafting younger guys like Arthur Marshall and Derek Russell. So it's kind of like... The turnover starts to happen. The turnover starts to happen. But the one thing I wanted to bring up is in the divisional round game, the one that sends them to Buffalo, they play the Houston Oilers. Okay. And much like the Browns, the Oilers are like also the choke artists of the NFL. And in this game, Denver's down 24 to 22, and Greg Montgomery gets off this amazing punt for Houston that puts Denver at the one yard line. At the one yard line. Again. Again. But it's against Houston this time. A team that also left town, much like the Browns. How do you like them, Apples? Yep. Elway leads them on this furious, crazy, crazy drive. He has a fourth down conversion he does with his legs. Johnson, on this drive, on the second fourth down, Elway avoids the rush. His offensive line at this point is really not protecting him. Houston's defense is really good. He scrambles outside of the pocket, and you see this streak, an 82 streak kind of across the field and kind of get depth. Yeah. Elway, like, just almost beer pong tosses it to and he's wide open because the defender in front of him had committed to stop Elway from running for another first down. Johnson gets the ball and catches and runs and just ends up in automatic field goal range because yeah. you're only down two, and that's what gives them the, the – uh, 26 to 24 when it was 24 to 23 so yeah just that last three that amigos was... amazing moment i want to bring this up is they still uh hold broncos records for playoff so i feel like uh each of them have records for like playoff receptions yeah the broncos they'll never be taught no. i mean the only guys who will ever in my opinion get into that neighborhood are like rod smith yeah rod smith and maybe mccaffrey they had a number of good ones to spread the ball out when Manning was there. So I don't know if they would have done that um, during that era. But yeah, they still hold Broncos records yeah. for uh, receiving. Because by 92, that was Natiel's last year. He ba- he basically oh, yeah. doesn't play. The team finishes eight, and, and that's the implosion of Dan Reeves' 92. Because what they did that year is, because Shanahan is gone again. He's with San Francisco, I believe. And I think he brought Kubiak with him too. Um they basically fired Dan Reeves at the end of the season. Yeah. 
And they do that because during that draft, they were trying to trade John Elway to a number of teams. They almost traded him to Washington. Okay. But in the first round, because Elway's been asking, like, look, the Amigos are hurt, and I need better playmakers. The Shannon Sharp guy's pretty damn good, though. Yeah. But I need, like, other players. In the first round, they draft Tommy Maddox. That was the year they drafted Tommy Maddox, and yeah. everything just hit, hit the shits. Yeah, they I was going to say, eight and eight. you mm-hmm. could see just the awful – Things that happen when you miss draft. Because 93, Natil's gone for, for good. I mean, he's re- retired. Jackson's in New York. Reeves brought him with him. Okay. And Johnson still plays, but he's not playing but a he's, lot. Yeah. He sits, Johnson even sits out 94. He comes back in 95, 95, but just decides not to come back after that. Yeah. And that's kind of where the three amigos break up. And, and uh, but they're still beloved. I mean, they were they were in Taco Bell commercials as recently as like five years ago. Yeah, when Denver had guys more like seven or eight, but guys like Welker and uh, what's his name, uh, Demarius Thomas and Eric Decker, guys like that. So yeah, well, we see this them being one of these teams that were at the door but never got through. And th- they they were a fun group. I mean, that's just a fun marketing ploy to have. I yeah, mean, they had a music favorite. video. God bless the 1980s. I know. Can we get back to that? Touchdown the- banditos. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. Hey, everybody. This is just a stock message at the end of every episode. We hope you enjoyed whatever athlete and or team that that episode was about. Just want to say give us a quick follow on all social media. We have a YouTube channel the sports experience podcast and we're on instagram to tolo dominic and myself c quinn comedy so give us a follow all around um we're always recording right here at angle studio thank you all very much